One of the most striking things about coral reefs are their brilliant colors. But it's images like these of white, skeletal, bleached coral, which have become all too familiar. The UN has warned that if temperatures rise 1.5 degrees, 90% of the world's coral will be wiped out. But in the Red Sea, corals have proved to be resilient to rising sea temperatures and climate change. They're known as super coral. But BBC News Arabic has discovered a hidden source of pollution that threatens to suffocate this precious resource. I see lead, I see cadmium, I see copper, I see nickel, I see heavy metals here. I'm finding it very alarming. In a joint investigation with journalism unit Source Material, BBC News Arabic uses specialist satellite imagery to uncover the damage being caused and asks whether coral can be protected from the new exploration for gas and oil. The world's eyes have been on Egypt for the United Nations Climate Summit, COP27, in Sharm el-Sheikh on the Red Sea coast. Scientists and civil society are calling for all of Egypt's Great Fringing Reef to be declared a protected area. Very few places on Earth compare to the Red Sea's marine biodiversity due in part to the almost 2,000 kilometers of unique coral reef. Tourism is one of the most important sources of income for Egypt. It accounts for around 12% of GDP. The Red Sea's coral is popular with divers and marine biologists come to study it too. Sylvia Earle, is a pioneering oceanographer who believes a great fringing reef could provide hope for endangered coral around the world. The good news is about half the coral reefs around the world are still in pretty good shape. They can be turned and recovered because at least they're, they're still there with the basic ingredients. But to go to really healthy places like some of the beautiful areas that are represented in the Red Sea, especially this area that we're now identifying as a hope spot. It's a model for what can be achieved elsewhere, or just to learn how, what, what is it about the corals in the Red Sea that makes them less vulnerable to the in, in increased heat. But while this coral might be more resilient to climate change, it is vulnerable to pollution. Just beyond the resort towns of the Red Sea coast is the Gulf of Suez. It's an industrial area that produces at least a quarter of Egypt's oil and gas. Oil leaks are hard to hide and have been well documented over the years along with the cleanup efforts that followed. But the BBC has discovered that there are other, less visible types of pollution that are going on unreported. Leaked documents show a major oil processing facility in the Gulf of Suez, called Ras Shukhair, has been dumping barely treated water into the Red Sea. It's known as produced water. Produced water is brought to the surface during oil and gas drilling and production. It can contain oil, grease and high levels of salt as well as toxins that can be dangerous for marine life. The Gulf of Suez Petroleum Company, known as Gupco, which operates Ras Shukhair oil processing plant, was jointly owned by BP and the state-owned Egyptian General Petroleum Company from 1999 till 2019. BP then sold its 50% stake in Gupco to United Arab Emirates firm Dragon Oil. Later that same year, Gupco set out to find a company to treat the water after a series of meetings with the Egyptian Environment Affairs Agency. In 2019, they sent out this tender to several companies. In the document, if you look just here, it lists all the different metals, chemicals, oil and grease in the produced water. 
Gulf Coast tender says that the produced water is being discharged into the sea with minimal treatment and notes that they need to build a water treatment plant in order to comply with Egyptian laws and regulations. Gupco's own tests of the water heading into the Red Sea show levels of toxins in breach of those same regulations. We also found this picture on Twitter, taken in 2020, of one company which they say shows what the water looks like before and after the treatment. In the tender, it says that 40,000 cubic meters of this produced water is being released a day. That's the equivalent of 16 Olympic-sized swimming pools entering the Red Sea every day, home to one of the world's most precious natural resources. A number of Egyptian scientists have reviewed the figures and told us about their concerns. They felt unable to speak publicly about them. But we found several experts who are able to speak freely and independently. I do know that there are set values for standards for water quality that would definitely affect ecosystem health. To me, it's analogous to uh, going to the doctor and getting a cholesterol test or getting a blood cell test. And the doctor has, you know, a range. What's an acceptable range? And look at these numbers. They're all 0.01s and 1s, most of them. And now flip to the next one and you have some pretty big numbers there. Yeah. So you don't have to be an expert to know that something is, is not right here. And what does that mean? for the marine life there? Each of these chemicals, some of these are elements. Uh, I see lead, I see cadmium, I see copper, I see nickel, I see heavy metals here. We know from a general scientific community that studies toxicology that these types of metals are not healthy for corals and algae and seagrass beds. It's concerning, it's, it's alarming, and it's something that um, I would hope that the um, industry and the, and the scientific community can get together and get a team in there to measure this stuff. Dr. Gira Troisi, a lecturer at Brunel University London, studies the effects of toxins on organisms. So produced water would be something that's very acidic, um, very salty, and that's what the data is showing us here. So this water's coming out and looks cloudy, okay, so it's opaque, it's not clear. That's not very good for corals, we're suffocating them and then shielding them from the light because of all of these suspended solids. Access to facilities such as Ras Shukair is restricted to oil workers and government inspectors alone. So we haven't been able to visit the area ourselves to see what the impact has been to date. On the ground, data is almost impossible to come by. From space, we found out that this water may have been spilling to the Red Sea for a very long time. You can see a greenish plume that begins at the site of the Ras Shukair facility. When we zoom in, we can see two water treatment ponds where the water is stored and is partially cleaned before being pumped out into the sea from this pipeline. We had a satellite specialist analyze historic images of the site using advanced water quality monitoring techniques. They found the same pattern of pollution flowing from the pipe, which can be seen clearly for many years. And even as far back as 1985. So satellite evidence tells us that this toxic water may have been flowing into the Red Sea for up to 37 years. And how far is it traveling exactly? Our analysis shows it flowing from the oil terminal carried by the current up to 20 kilometers south to an area where we know coral exists. Local and international marine biologists have campaigned for the Egyptian government to include the area around Ras Shukair in a new marine protection area. But given the levels of pollution, will there be anything left to protect? Allen Coral Atlas uses high-resolution satellite imagery to see through the water surface and monitor the world's coral reefs. We asked its director to assess the impact of the Ras Shukhir terminal on nearby marine life. This red color tells us that there's a high probability that along the coast, south of the refinery, there's quite a lot of ecosystem that contains some mix of algae and living corals and other species that would depend on this ecosystem. Certainly, I, I can say that there's a lot of life along this coast. What I can say from just looking at the raw satellite data, now I've turned off everything and I'm using my, my experience. Look at this. 
we can see just visually that there's an ecosystem here. And then suddenly it's hard to see through the water. I, I can't even see the bottom here, even in the raw imagery, because there's this something on the surface, which is, looks like a pollution, like a, like a plume. Uh, what we do know is that there's something here worth uh, understanding and something here worth potentially saving and, and conserving. The damage to the coral may have been happening for at least 40 years. And for half of that time, BP owned 50% of the company. It sold its stake in Gupco in 2019. Critics say this was in order to help it meet climate targets. We know that big oil companies you know, really want to try to paint themselves as green. They, they want to try and flaunt their green credentials. Yet at the very same time, all too often, many of them are actually spending billions lobbying governments to delay climate action. So frankly, it comes as no surprise to learn that BP and others would far rather flog off their dirtiest, most environmentally damaging assets rather than clean them up themselves. Shell and Chevron have recently explored further oil and gas drilling here, just 30 kilometers away from the protected areas. So can the Egyptian government manage the protection of this area? We tried to speak to the environment ministry in Egypt about our findings, but neither the ministry nor Gobco or the owners of Gobco responded to our request for comments. Egypt clearly recognizes the importance of conserving the treasures of the Red Sea for its vital tourism industry and future of the underwater world. But its economy also benefits from exploiting current and future oil and gas reserves. These dual demands, as we've seen, are almost always at odds with each other. If its state-owned oil companies are able to operate in breach of environmental regulations without penalty, can Egypt protect coral's last refuge? 